Let's do some headlines. All right, we've already covered a lot of news. It's been a lot of fun. But the first thing, the big story today is looking at the U.S. dollar. So starting with marketwatch.com, the decline of the U.S. dollar could happen at warp speed in the era of coronavirus, warns prominent economist Stephen Roach. Stephen Roach, a Yale University senior fellow and former Morgan Stanley Asia chairman, tells Market Watch that his forecast for a sharp deterioration of the U.S. dollar could be a very near-term phenomenon, not an event that looms off in the distance. I do think it's something that happens sooner rather than later, the economist told Market Watch during a Monday afternoon interview. His comments come as the financial expert has been warning for weeks of an epic downturn of the buck that could signal the end of the hegemony of the greenback as a reserve currency, an event that would ripple through global financial markets. You know, it's, it's going to be more than that. It's not like this is almost underselling it. If the dollar goes to the death spiral of inflation, it's not just, Hey, it's going to ripple through global financial markets. You're going to see, you're going to first, you're going to see the dollar go radically reduced in its international presence. The death of the petrodollar, not using it for so many mechanisms of international trade that are already just in in regular practice. Things that we have been watching over the last decade or so, switching even in the petrodollar like China and Russia in a lot of their oil exchanges. They used to have to use the dollar, not anymore. And that was just one of the impositions of the U.S. dollar empire that bit by bit, you know, why did they why did they take out Gaddafi as part of the Arab Spring? Well, maybe it was because he was working on a gold backed currency for the continent of Africa that would challenge the dollar there in a lot of ways. So it's really a kind of, you know, cleansing for the world. Like they ripple through global financial markets. Yeah. The people who have been profiting as as ambassadors of the global dollar empire, you might call them. Yeah, they're going to suffer. Those companies attached to them are going to suffer or might if they do in, in, on the whole. But what we're talking about by getting the dollar out of the world economy, uh, well, you remember Ross Perot used to call or, or called it famously that giant sucking sound from Mexico? Well, really, what's the bigger sucking sound? It's the sucking of wealth and value from the rest of the world into America into the, well, really into the American economic system, into the banking system, the financial system. And yes, a lot of that goes to improve your quality of life. If you're an American, if you're a citizen of the empire, you benefit from this as well. But we all suffer because in order to keep this going in America, your economic rights have to be restricted. But it's really the exploitation of the rest of the world through the dollar that is the the, the most evil of its effects, other than funding war and, and armed conflict, of course. And so then when, when that happens, it, you know, it's, it, it, it is, it, it's a short little chain of events. I mean, we would say dominoes, dominoes suggest like a longer, and it may be, if you want to use the domino metaphor, it's a lot of small, it's a lot of small dominoes. Like if you want to go back to Bretton Woods and all of the things that made, you know, the, the Jekyll Island, the, uh, you know, Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and say, look, you know, since all of these things, we, we, we've had this growth of the dollar, the modern U.S. dollar empire. I mean, you can also you got to include in this narrative 1972, Richard Nixon taking the dollar off of the gold standard. Now they can just have you know, more money created and they don't have to have it tethered to any physical reality of gold in any way whatsoever. And at that point, the only thing backing up the U.S. dollar is the violence of the U.S. government forcing people to use it both to pay taxes and in petrodollar transactions and so many other uh, international market manipulations generally uh, connected to, you know, the CIA or the U.S. military. This is, uh, you know, confessions of an economic hitman kind of stuff I'm talking about here. So if you want to use the domino metaphor, you get like to the end, if if maybe the dollar is, is, is the last domino in the chain, the dollar. So, well, you know, it's, a, it's even at its reduced stature, after all of these prior dominoes, it's a big domino. Rejecting 
the dollar as the world reserve currency, as the petrodollar, these are bigger dominoes leading up to like the last few. But, uh, you know, as it says, the end of the hegemony of the greenback as a reserve currency, that's like the first big domino in the last few big dominoes. And it's if, if, if we hit one of those, it's going to go fast. So I'm looking at these two stories today. First, we're looking at marketwatch.com. Of course, then we're going to go to uh, to Reuters for uh, the inflation dogma. Finally, Bark investors bet. And this is, you know, looking at like, how close are we? Is this really happening? So back to the market watch story. In a COVID era, everything unfolds at warp speed, Roach told market watch on Monday. He pointed to the contraction of the U.S. economy from an employment rate that was hovering around a 50-year low at around 3.5% near the start of 2020 to one that shows some 49 million people unemployed since the pandemic took hold in March. He also noted the rapid and unprecedented fiscal and monetary response that has ballooned the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to more than $7.2 trillion from $4 trillion at the start of the year as examples of the celerity at which the currency market could change. Roach is calling for the dollar to soon decline 35% against its major rivals, citing increases in the nation's deficit and dwindling savings. As he said, this massive shift to fiscal stimulus is going to blow out the national savings rate and the current account deficit. Last week, the U.S. current account deficit, a measure of the nation's debt to other countries, slipped 0.1% in the first quarter, falling to $104.2 billion from a revised $104.3 in the, four, in the 2019 fourth quarter. The current account reveals if a country is a net lender or debtor. So 35%. So when someone says like the dollar is going to decline 35%, I think what they really mean is that the dollar is going to soon decline 100%. Because this would not be a downturn. This would not be a fluctuation. If you look at any of the graphs that chart the devaluation of the U.S. dollar over the last hundred years, you know, that show, you know, burr, burr, and it's this long, steady decline. It's lost 95, 97% of its value, depending on, you know, how exactly you want to measure that. So some would say more at this point, but that's been a relatively smooth decline. Yes, there's, there's been some jagged lines. There's been the, you know, the crisis in the 70s. You know, there, there have been, you know, manipulations around World War II, World War I, obviously. But the overall path of the decline of the dollar has been relatively steady. Could it take a 35% hit right now and survive? I don't think so. I mean, it says 35%, you know, Roach is calling for that. Over what period of time? If it happens in... 10 years, well, then you go, well, that's actually a reduction in the decline rate. If it happens over one year, you go, well, that's a significant acceleration. If it's 35% and it happens in a month, that's, that's off the deep end. And this is kind of a confidence game. Thank you, CJ. That's a great example of, of this chart. This is buying, buying power of a dollar over time from, well, that's 1800 to 2020. So you almost want to just look at the at the second half of that to see the modern U.S. dollar under the current Federal Reserve system. Um, but yeah, that's very clearly, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of ways people will manipulate the statistics around that. But hey, purchasing power of the dollar decline. They create more money in D.C. That's inflation or with the Federal Reserve system and with uh, fractional reserve banking, which is actually where most of the money comes from. A lot of libertarians misunderstand this. A lot of fans of end the Fed, people who get into that stuff think, oh, it's just, it's the Federal Reserve. It's not just the Federal Reserve. It's the Federal Reserve underpinning the banking system, the FDIC, Federal Department of Insurance Corporation, all the ways that the federal government makes it legal and economically viable for banks to do 
fractional reserve lending. And it's a complicated system. You can study it a lot. The core concept, very simple, very easy to understand based on that word, fractional reserve lending. It's if a bank has $10 in the bank, they can use that as a fraction of what they're lending out and lend someone $100 and say, well, it's okay, we've got 10 of it backed up. And you go, wait, you just rate $90 out of thin air? Like, how did, you, how did you do that? Well, because they're able to do that legally in the system and without the liability that the market would hold them accountable for and actually making those loans because those loans might get called in or, or you know, um, those those notes would, would get used. And then there are consequences when the bank, people go to the bank and say, all right, we've got these claims for, you know, 10 gold coins and or 100 gold coins. And, you know, you, oh, you only have 10 gold coins in your vault. Well, mm, you're going out of business. You're a fraud. But that's what we've done, like this whole system. The, the whole dollar. What, what is the U.S. dollar? It's a form of legalized fraud. Backed up by the violence of the U.S. government. In case anybody figures it out and tries to resist or call anybody's attention to this by creating an alternative system. This is why I'm such a fan of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency in general. And creating these alternatives, I mean, obviously, I'm a fan of gold and silver. Right now, I actually have more money in gold and silver than crypto, sadly. I, I consider that my, my foundation. And I'm, I, I've spent, uh, I've had to liquidate and, and use, unfortunately, uh, most of my crypto at this point. So very disappointing for myself. That's my own personal financial hardship as a result of the coronavirus forced unemployment pandemic. But look, I'm still doing fine because I had that buffer because I did plan this out, because I own my home. I have a homestead where I can come and have everything that I need and not depend on any centralized system if I don't want to. Now, we're not there yet. I'm not I'm not trying to brag like, hey, I'm perfect, I got it all set up. You know, I'm still a relatively poor dude trying to put all this together, but I feel a lot richer because of how I've spent my money, how I've invested it in things that, you know, have value regardless of this. And this might be your last chance, you know, we talked about pulling people out of collapsing buildings. I'm doing it right now. I'm pulling you out of the collapsing economic system because you see what's happening with the dollar right now. This might be your last chance because I can't I can't actually pull you. Like the metaphor fails here, right, Jim? I'm not actually pulling people out of the collapsing building that is the society of the state, you know, crumbling around us. No, I'm showing people the way out. You have to do it for yourself. You have to say, I see this. I want this. I don't believe the, the hype anymore. And I'm, I'm not just going to go along to get along. I'm going to do better for myself. So uh, back to Market Watch. Roach said that his recent warnings about the dollar have garnered intense and emotional responses from readers and critics because he believes that the U.S., is at a particularly sensitive time in history. He said the racial upheaval sparked by the death of George Floyd, the pandemic and the intensity of the presidential election have combined to elicit powerful responses from readers that he hasn't gotten since his days writing financial commentary at Morgan Stanley. He said during this time, you're going to get hair trigger responses from people. We're at a critical point in the political cycle and the dollar is a relative price. So you're making a comparison to the United States and other countries, and there are just really strong views against the analysts that call into question U.S. dominance. Surprise, surprise. So now, asked if investors should be fearful of a downturn of the dollar, Roach said that this wouldn't be the first time the dollar has slumped meaningfully and that fear is a question of context. Fear may be justified if they are unprepared and not hedged and have not thought about what some of the options are uh, take, to take advantage of. He said, pointing to the euro as a possible alternative. And it's true, if you want to stay in the system, you know, it's it's kind of like you're you're leaping from sinking ship to sinking ship. No, no, no. Come over here to safe, dry land in economic reality away from fiat currencies. Now, jumping to the next story from Reuters.com, inflation dog may finally bark investors bet. Looking at some different perspectives on this issue, gold, forest, property stocks, inflation-linked bonds, these are just some of the assets investors are pouring money into on the view that the recent explosion of government spending and central bank stimulus may finally rouse inflation 
from its decades-long slumber. And the caption in this photo here, you see some people uh, uh, behind uh, arrays of computer monitors. And it says NYSE-AMEX, New York Stock Exchange slash AMEX, options floor traders from Trade Moss Inc. work off work in an off-site trading office built when the New York Stock Exchange closed due to the outbreak of the coronavirus disease in the Brooklyn borough of New York City. So all of this is happening now. And remember that all of these bigger economic factors are not driven so much by the average American who has money in an, a 401k or an IRA or uh, you know mutual funds or, or anything like that. It's by these people who are constantly trading, looking for the economic edge. Now, in a free market, you would still have some kind of markets for commodities, for currencies, for companies, for stock, things like that, because it's an important market function to set prices and to direct resources. And in today's system, we have huge distortions that make this function uh, a lot scarier, uh, a lot more like, you know, the margins would be smaller if you had a free market. You wouldn't have wild swings. You wouldn't have the casino of the stock market. You wouldn't have the inflation of stock market prices through uh, corporatism and, and all the other manipulations that happen here. So but it, right now, we go, well, is the dollar going to collapse? Well, let's look at what the people who really have the skin in the game are doing with their money, shall we? Sure enough, market-based gauges suggest an uptrend in prices. Uh, I'm sorry, far, sorry, I missed the line of the story. With the world economy forecast to shrink 6% this year, it may seem like a strange time to fret about inflation. And sure enough, market-based gauges suggest an uptrend in prices may not trouble investors for years. U.S. and Eurozone inflation gauges indicate that annual price growth will be running at barely over 1% even a decade from now. So if inflation really is, as the IMF put it in 2013, the dog that didn't bark failing to respond to all the central bank money printing unleashed in the wake of the 2008-2009 crisis, why should investors prepare for it now, especially as demographics and technology are also conspiring to tamp down inflation across the developed world? Now, I, I got to just examine like one little part of the wording here. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, called inflation... The dog that didn't bark. I mean, really, it could be like the dog that didn't bite might be more accurate. But it's a dog that's biting. I just the, the, the I'm for, I'm I I look at this analogy and I go ah propaganda. Let me deconstruct it. The dog that didn't bark. It, it's it's the dog. It, you know, I'm trying to you know is it, it, show so how this analogy is not accurate to reality. It's not that inflation is the dog that didn't bark. It's the part of our racket that we were able to keep going. And that they, they have, what they have done, and this is like this kind of economic propaganda has so many baked in assumptions that we just take for granted. Oh, inflation isn't the, the, the part of this criminal racket. It's just this, this side effect of of, you know, having an advanced economy and, oh, this portion is a dog that didn't bark. Man, you know, the IMF, uh, they protected us from it. This, no. I mean, it is. this is why the uh, Stockholm Syndrome, you know, loving your captors is such an apt metaphor for modern government. So uh, the answer is that something the dog really will bark this time, partly because unlike in the post-2008 years, governments around the world have also been rolling out massive spending packages in a bid to limit the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. We will be pushing, pushing, pushing on the string and dropping our guard. Then three to five years from now, that's when the inflation dog will start barking, said Pinebridge Investments head of multi-asset Mike Kelly, who has been buying gold on that view. Gold worries about such things long in advance. It has risen through this coronavirus with that down-the-road risk top of mind, he added. Even typically frugal governments such as Germany have joined central banks with trillions of dollars in stimulating programs. Investors say even the long taboo topic of debt monetization where central banks directly fund government spending may be on the cards. 
What worries me is that at the moment, it seems that there is no limit to fiscal stimulus, said Klaus Calder Morgan, a portfolio manager at asset manager DWS, who said he was investing in inflation hedges far more now <clears throat> than he was after 2008. Inflation hawks also cite a trend of deglobalization, where shrinking international trade in Western companies bringing production back to their own countries leads to higher prices. Yeah, well, that would, that would be protectionism. This view at nationalism, although you don't call it, that, well, it would be nationalism and socialism. But no, don't, don't point out that there's a rise in the underlying philosophy of Nazism behind this whole thing. Surprise, surprise. This view that inflate, did, did I just, uh, did I just lose the internet? Did I, I what's the test? Did I just fail the, uh, <laughs> the first person to bring Hitler into an argument loses? No, but yeah, obviously there's, this is, this is something, you know, deeper than this. So what to buy? Investors have an interest in pricing future inflation correctly to safeguard their returns, hence the need for hedges, assets that increase in value, or at least hold it when price growth accelerates. So primarily bonds and gold for you know, U.S. inflation-linked items. Uh, wealth managers, canvas by Reuters, have been channeling up to 10% into gold via index funds, gold shares, and even bullion. So yeah, and, and I've skipped a few stories this week about the rush to gold. This is it in the number. But if gold prices have risen 18% since the end of March, some other hedges remain cheap, so there's still time to get in. Woods and Forest didn't expect to see this in the story, and it's not just about gold or linkers. Another choice is real estate. Calder Morgan of DWS is buying German residential property stocks, betting that the supply of new property will rise slower than the money supply, of course. Global house prices adjusted for inflation rose 14% from 2009 to 19, so over a decade, according to the IMF. Legal and generals Jeffrey accelerated investments in agricultural land and forestry earlier this year in expectation they will retain their real value over the five to 10 year horizon. His holdings are via publicly listed shares of companies heavily exposed to such land. Timber prices rose over 130% in real terms in Great Britain over the past decade. Forest research data shows while the U.S. value of farmland rose 28%. In the decade of 2019, according to the Department of Agriculture. Now, I I don't mean to just you know conflate the issue here or confuse things, but remember there's there's a lot of land that is being held back from the market by governments all over the world. So that might be a huge switch in that. You got to watch carefully. If the governments start giving up land in meaningful ways, like the 50% of the land west of the Mississippi that is owned by the U.S. federal government, there are going to be massive upheavals throughout the real estate market as well that are actually have the potential to make the real estate upheavals that we've seen so far most poignantly in commercial real estate with huge plummets in prices there as a result of the coronavirus a state of emergency uh, declared by President Trump, not the virus itself. And that might, but that's going to lag. For now, I think you're, I think you're still safe buying and investing in land. Ultimately, gold and silver, crypto, other things. But you guys see the idea, get away from this fiat currency. Kelly of Pinebridge also favors Timberland purchased through private funds while predicting that linkers will remain Cheap for the next few years. He expects timber to benefit soon of rock bottom. Mortgages entice more first time home buyers and fuel a construction boom. I don't think we're going to have a construction boom when we have more empty houses than homeless people in the United States as a result of the mortgage market manipulation referenced here. So, one way or another, get away from the system. What we see now, and, and this is what I think of as the first bigger domino in the collapse, is the end of the confidence. I mean, what is the, what is the U.S. dollar? It's a confidence racket. I have confidence in this piece of paper that the federal government of the United States will be able to enforce its value. Well... 
with cops being pushed back from the Chaz as much as libertarians and conservatives want to say, nah, yeah, that's a bunch of disgusting socialists, communists, hippie liberals, and it's true. They are doing something beautiful and righteous saying, no, go away, police. We don't want you here. You think the government that can't do that can prop up the U.S. dollar empire for long? When so many people, even at the investor level, are turning away from it? I don't think so.